All right, we're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fredericks from the Army Cyber Institute. Um, today we will execute an information warfare paper session that features papers that focus on the prominence of fake news and disinformation and how it has tied into recent international affairs. Our first presenter is uh, Dr. Shark Sample. She is a research fellow employed at the ICF Inc. at the U.S. Army Research Laboratory in Adolphi, Maryland. She is here to present her paper titled, A Model for Evaluating Fake News. Uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Sample. Hi there. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me okay, right? So, okay. Um, so welcome to this talk, and I'll warn you right now, I'm a little bit nervous. I, I get a little, a little nervous when I have to speak in front of a crowd. And I had a friend that told me many years ago, I said, Char, don't worry, whenever you get in front of a crowd, just remember to please speak slowly, smile, and wear a skirt. So I got the skirt on. I cannot guarantee I'm going to speak slowly, and um, I will try to smile. It, it might be a grimace. Anyways, um, let's talk a little bit about fake news today. I, I think it's an exciting subject, and I think it's, in, in my humble opinion, this was the event that has caught the cybersecurity world um, kind of by surprise. Um, by now, it's no longer a, as big a surprise because 2016 was the big year that we had all the uh, fun events happen. And I like to point out that I'm also the, luck, the uh, I guess, Mr. Putin's good luck charm because I happen to be in England for the Brexit vote and I was here for the, our November election in 2016. So um, I think one more vote and I, I guess yeah, in baseball terms I'll strike out. So, um, okay, so what had happened was um, when this first emerged, um, I kind of got a little tip off back in September of 2016 of what was going on. And um, I didn't really think it would happen. And, and like a lot of us, I kind of came um, with a lot of opinions and biases, which is ironic considering I also do research on behaviors and um, cognition and um, cyber, so I should know better. But even I thought things like we should, you know, we, we can resist this. We're smart. We're America. We can do all these wonderful things. Um, so my background, of course, is that I have a doctor of science from, uh, from Capital Tech in um, cybersecurity. And the other two authors were also doctors in the program that followed me, and we just all got together, and we get along really well. So we said, let's, let's tackle fake news. Um, unfortunately, I can't tell you much about Connie, except that she works at IUPUI. She's wonderful to work with, and I think she's a professor there, and she has her living lab, which is relevant for part of this model. And Emily uh, used to work at Northrop Grumman, and now I forget what bank she's working for, but now she's CTO, so, um, but she, she just loves, she's addicted to the topic, too. So um, how this work came about, there is a paper I have referenced here, number two, um, The Menace of Unreality, How the Kremlin Weaponizes Information, um, Currency, and Money. This actually was the paper that somebody pointed out to me back in 2016, um, or in, in September. The paper was written in 2014. And um, after I read the paper, I was talking to some of my friends over at the University of Warwick and um, over at DSTL, and we were talking about this, and, and we still, at the time, didn't realize how well um, the United States, the different organizations on both sides of the political spectrum had been infiltrated. Um, <laughs> it wasn't until you started talking to people that you started realizing um, how our biases and beliefs were played so well. So, um, go on to the next slide. These were, when we used some sources, so when I turned in the initial paper here, I said, let's, let's look at this model. There's, there's three aspects to the model I'll keep harping on. One is computational linguistics, another is um, pattern spread, and the third one is this idea of doing source provenance. So the computational linguistics piece, I, we, we said, well, I'm, I'm not a computational linguist. I do know a little bit of R, and um, I know a few things that I remember from uh, my grade school grammar classes. And I thought, let's see what we can find just kind of poking around. And it turned out that um, when I got put the paper in, so the, the response came back, well, we like the paper. Would you mind walking us through an example? So he, these were the sources we used for the example. Now, there were a couple reasons these were chosen. This one up on the top left was just a somebody's blog sit, spot. But we wanted to get an opinion piece because we wanted to see how the, uh, again, how this would differ computationally uh, from a news story, news article. New York Post we knew would be a biased one on the right. 
we knew that the Washington Post, uh, down I believe on the bottom right, um, it would be biased on the left. We knew that uh, we, we didn't know what to expect with NBC, and we kind of suspected Fox might be a little bit on the uh, right side of the spectrum. And um, we, we did know we, that there was one thing everyone can agree on, and that is this notion that AP, Reuters, and Bloomberg tend to be the sources uh, that, are, that can be viewed as ground truth. And why do I say that? Well, because AP and Reuters, they simply report events that happen. The stories get picked up by the other news sources. They use those, and then they build on the story. They embellish. Now, Reuters, uh, um, Bloomberg, I was less sure of, but then somebody who used to work at Bloomberg told me, said, yes, we have to be very factually accurate because investment decisions are made based on what we do. So I said, aha, I found my nugget for what I would consider mu, uh, you know, or my mean, and now I can uh, start looking at how we deviate off of these. So... I'll get back to that in a second. So what is fake news? What is truth? Um, so um, one of the things that my friends in, uh, over at the UK, uh, over at DSTL, set me straight on right away, they said, quit saying the truth, because truth turns out that Mr. Giuliani was partially correct when he said this, um, has a bias itself. It is your perception is the reality, therefore that is your truth. So we changed it to fact-based. What are the fact-based pieces that, we, that are not in dispute? And then we can measure off of the fact or the fact-based narrative. So we have, um, you know, we have partial truth. We have um, outright fabrication. We're not necessarily trying to say something is true or false, but what we want to measure is how far it deviates off of the fact-based narrative. Uh, propaganda is also some, you know, uh, another component of this, and there's actually, we, we believe, follow-on research where we can actually um, take the computational linguistics and compare what we see in, these, um, in some of these stories to see how closely they align with various propaganda uh, stories that come out of other governments, because it's not just the Kremlin that does it. Um, why this matters, and of course the question of should this matter, well, I, I think this matters a lot, particularly in, a, in an open society. We need to be able to trust our institutions. I held a workshop um, over the summer, and I, um, one of the attendees was a um, former NATO commander, commander from Finland. And um, I, I asked him towards the end of the session of the workshop, I said, Marty, I, I got a question for you. He said, no, Marty, for several years. And I said, um, how is it that Finland keeps resisting all of this. Um, and I said, and don't tell me it's the education because I know some very well-educated, smart people who fall for it. And he said, well, truth of the matter is it's not really education. He said, we believe in our institutions and we also limit the amount of data that people see. The, we limit the news sources, which I thought was rather interesting. Um, we are not going to certainly limit our news sources here in the country, so that doesn't do us much good to try to even go down that path. And earlier this morning, somebody said something about um, monitoring Facebook and some of these other sites and regulating them. And I thought, yeah, in the country that said corporations are people or citizens, the same, same thing, we're going to monitor their speech, not going to happen. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is find ways to measure how far what they're, what they're telling us is off of the truth. And we can also start measuring their behaviors, um, as you're going to find out soon. And so let's go on to some of our popular misconceptions about fake news before I jump into this too far. Uh, there's the education myth, which I briefly touched on. That, and that's this notion that um, because you're educated, you will be able to see fake news and immediately reject it. No. Um, maybe in the past that was true. We're talking about stories that are crafted specifically to your deepest held beliefs. Um, I liken what Cambridge Analytica did um, with looking at the different profiles on Facebook. The, it, it's like having your teenage daughter's diary and reading it and then uh, being able to predict her behavior based on that, right? So, um, but there is a good, there is a silver lining. They didn't get it all the way right because when the story about Cambridge, this is a funny little anecdote, when the story about Cambridge Analytica first broke, I thought, I should let them profile me. Now, I have my picture on Facebook. I have my picture on LinkedIn. Um, some of you may have already seen what I look like um, on, online. Not that different than what I look like up here. They ran their profile on me and they had determined that I am a 30-something single white male. My husband was really disappointed to hear that. Um, I was like, no. Um, it turned out that I, my like, they went by my likes. 
Um, and one of the things that I liked was the History Channel. So that uh, associated with, apparently, young men. Um, there's the other myth that if I can only just Google and check these other news sources, I'll know what's fake and what's real because I'll get the verification on that. Well, there's some way to rule two of these into one here. First of all, the weighting algorithms um, uh, from the machine learning of what your habits are are going to bring you back what, you, what is predicted that you will like based on your previous queries. And I was actually at a workshop, but like in 2017, um, down in Crystal City, and w this exact issue came up, and the folks at Facebook said, we have tried experimenting with putting in these alternative views, and people skip past them. They are going to go with their preferences. So we're not going to see these algorithms get changed. These, uh, that's, that's not how they're going to um, keep their business going. It's bad for the business model. Um, the idea that more news sources is, is, um, is better, you're going, what, what we've seen happen, of course, is the emergence of the echo chamber. I just find more and more sources that support my view. It's even better. Um, I'm uh, on a committee for another conference, and um, we, get some, so we get submissions from all over the world. Somebody submitted for a track that I was chairing uh, from Russia, and they put together an academic paper. Now you think, oh, heck, academic paper, this ought to be something I should trust. Well, guess what? It started off really, really, really well written, and then it somewhere about two-thirds of the way through kind of fell off the rails, jumped on the crazy train, and came up with all kind of um, garbage that I, I was like, in fact, I actually told the organizers, I said, this is clearly propaganda. I want the person to show up at the conference and make a lot of modifications just so I can ask them a lot of questions. They didn't show up. So, uh, so I see we hit all of these. And then the final one here is it's just propaganda. Uh, when this first this problem first was um, uh, brought to everyone's attention, I had a lot of old timers, uh, people who had been around for a long time in the Cold War days, say, "But it's just propaganda. We 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 know how to fight this. This is 21st century propaganda. It's different. The delivery is different. Um, it it goes faster." The, um, there's an interactive nature to it, in addition to the customization. In the past, propaganda was customized towards um, citizens of a country or a group of people. Now it can be customized down to the individual. And then we can go ahead and throw a, bo a bot or a troll or sock pot puppet at it and say, hey, we can keep the, co the conversation going and really get you going, get you uh, fired up. So it is different. Um, so what we decided was, um, we, you know, I, I had some time to mull this over, and I have to tell you that when I first um, asked if I could research this, uh, I kind of caught some people at ARL off guard, and at first they said, yeah, go ahead. And I said, okay. And then about, oh, I don't know, not even a month later, they're like, yeah, you can't talk about fake news, because this was early 2017. I said, um, you know, we, we got to figure out what's, what's going on, what we're allowed to say and what we're not allowed to say, and how we're allowed to research this or not. But, of course, my friends over in the UK provided uh, very good cover for me. So um, DSTL helped out a lot. Um, and then the British Computing Society gave me opportunities to talk to other people and talk about fake news and kind of start refining things. Now, my initial thought was that the pattern spread would be what was unique about fake news. But it turns out, um, back to our other things, we have the computational linguistics is actually quite interesting. And um, there was some great work done up by um, Sybil Adali up at Rensselaer Poly. And they, she had done a paper um, where she had looked at fake news, satire, and the truth. And she compared the fake news stories to satire and found that, and she just threw a basic machine learning algorithm with a couple of rules at it. And what she found was that they could predict the fake news with a 70 plus percent accuracy rate. So I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Actually, what they did was they just said it, it matches satire. Um, they didn't go all the way deep into to it what, the way I kind of wanted to go into it. So I said, well, this is good, because now this proves that this idea that there are unique, comp uh, li unique linguistic characteristics that we can key on that we can use to go ahead and uh, figure out if this is fake or valid. So then um, I still think the pattern spread is, int uh, is of interest. But the, what jumped out at me in all of this is we have no idea of how to baseline what is normal, what is the truth. And uh, the old Jonathan Swift quote um, that the uh, falsehoods fly and the truth comes limping after um, turns out to be true. The final piece here at the very bottom, you see Archive SP that's um, talking about source provenance. 
we believe that if we can collect all of this all the information that we need on the first two pieces, that we can actually get new metadata about both the uh, true and the various deviations off the of truth. We can collect metadata on that and come up with new insights by processing that metadata too. So that when you get a new story that comes out of the wild and maybe did not have a chance for AP or Reuters to pick up on it first, you would be able to determine the characteristics of it to see if it is indeed how far it would measure off the of truth. So um, again, I mentioned AP stories, that GT you see in the middle, ground truth, that little mu, that's, that's where we expect to find AP clustering. And then uh, on the far side, we have minus 10. Oh, I just noticed that my slide has a plus 10 under where it should be over on the right. So uh, let's see which one is this one. Yeah, it, that 10 there should be over there. But I just noticed that the slide has that little error in it. OK, so minus 10 is how far the context has been removed from the slide. Um, plus 10 is how much the slide has been, how much the story has been embellished. How do I know it? So um, I started with something simple like the word count. So I took the, uh, the infamous, as you saw from my sources, I, I took the story where Hillary Clinton um, had her episode at the 9-11 memorial in 2016. And some people, you know, one side said, nope, it's, it's pneumonia. She shouldn't have gone. She should have just taken a rest. And then the other side said, oh, no, she's got Parkinson's or she has MS and she's going to die. And, you know, they go through this whole, it was like, now this is a pretty wide range of narratives to go after. So um, we looked at them and we said, okay, what is the word count? And so AP, my mu, comes in at 840 words. Now, Connor Post was the one that I told you was an opinion piece that I wanted to be able to just collect for other reasons. And that one came in at 923 words. And you'll see that Fox News over here um, comes in at 179 words. NBC came in at 885, so they were actually pretty close. New York Post came in under. And there's our big buy, bad Washington Post coming in uh, at 1331 words. So there's an awful lot of embellishment going on here. So what we see here is the percent change, how these are deviating off of the AP story, the source, the ground truth. So my Connor Post only came off by 10% on, on just on the word count. Now remember, the important part here is we want to be able to capture which way this is going to go on my scale from minus to plus. And you see here the Fox News deviated off by 79%. So they're missing large portions of the story. Again, this gives, the, uh, gives them the opportunity to either shape your views or let you fill in the blanks yourself. NBC News surprisingly only came off 5% on this one. New York Post minus 17, and there is Washington Post, a big bad plus 58%. So there, there it is uh, graphically for you. Then um, I remember from again, grade school, that adverbs and adjectives are words that uh, get people into action. So I um, did an adjective count, and they were, uh, there was some difference in them, but it wasn't nothing, it was not terribly stark for that particular story, and I was also under a deadline to finish this. So I uh, also looked at adverbs, and it turns out that, oh wow, <laughs> okay. So adverbs, it turns out, um, are words of actions, so that they were easy to find, and we find here, um, I've got five minutes left, so I've got to like really blow through this. Uh, we found here that, whoops, AP News, um, sorry, okay. AP News came in at uh, zero, right, which is what we expect, that's mu. Connor Post had um, an, a lot of adverbs in their story. They were trying to, they're an opinion piece. Fox News came in with less, and we find that Washington Post came in high too, but um, it turned out that their overall count started putting context to a lot of what they were saying. So they're still not out of the woods yet, but they're uh, bringing their score down. New York Post came in really high on theirs. As you can see, they really had a lot of adjectives. So there's our, our graph. So now, just take the, the values, I averaged them out, didn't even put any weights to them, divide by 10, um, you know, because we're 100%, so we want to get these on the zero, uh, minus 10 to plus 10 scale, and this was the scoring that we came up on the computational linguistics. Now, we believe the computational linguistics, we can come up with these scores, use this to tag stories as they come in, because this is now feeding our, we'll, we'll feed the machine learning, that we can say, okay, this is the characteristics, and we need to. We know we need to come up with other features, and I'll be happy to discuss those on break because I know I'm running late. This is. The, uh, I'm going to get to the pattern spread. This is very important here. This was uh, took a hashtag uh, associated with the Catalan referendum uh, from August 2017 to December 2017, and you see here that big peak in the middle. That was when the election went on. Superimposed it with the Spanish um, uh, referendum that Russia used that hashtag, and you can see it just dwarfed the blue 
There, there were my three bumps on the blue, right? And you also not only see that it comes up very high, it starts quickly, goes straight up, and it comes right back down just as quickly. Now, the goal is not to necessarily start looking at just how these special patterns emerge, but to understand this baseline blue and see how we deviate off of the baseline blue. Otherwise, if we go with the, uh, by trying to pattern just the amber color, we're going to end up doing signatures. And we don't want to do signatures because we've already seen how, how great those are. So um, the last piece I mentioned, we want to build an archive of the fake news um, information that we capture from all of this. And that archive would, of course, Give, hopefully give us new insights. Um, we may notice that certain um, authors start moving more towards one side or the other side um, because, um, as you, I mentioned in the paper, there was a report by Trend Micro that came out in 2017 about fake news. They said it cost $50,000 to discredit a reporter. And it cost $200,000 to stage a protest. So in terms of political elections, that's pretty cheap. Um, so somebody might get suckered, might be... Uh, might be shown to make a mistake, but if we trend them over time, we would be able to see if this is a pattern that's going on or not. Okay, I've got one minute left here. <laughs> okay, way forward. This is a multi-faceted, uh, multi-discipline problem. Um, so it's not just using computational linguistics, it's actually talking to people who, communications professors that understand rhetoric and working with linguists in addition to the cybersecurity department. Uh, the pattern spread, that's clearly a math problem. And the um, archive, well, that's obviously computer science and data, data science. Um, quick conclusions here. Um, we're going to actually have to uh, do some tuning. We also recognize that as we move across different languages, that there will be different uh, hooks in, way, in the way that this is all done. Um, and we believe that the creation of the metadata archive, which we're right now targeting for Indiana University um, at Purdue, under Dr. Justice, that's her, her uh, it's going to be her baby. We believe that we'll be able to uh, create something that other people can research without having to have all the news stories themselves. So that's my contact info. I'm happy to answer any questions. Do I, I have time to answer questions, right? Yeah, we'll keep <coughs> okay. Surely somebody has a question. <laughs> yes. Leslie R. Socratic Arts. Um, my question is about, I know of one and possibly two private sector firms that are trying to create what might be called smart news. Mm -hmm. Are you working with these firms? I mean, um, how they might be determining how to deliver the quality news to people who want it so they can get the bad feeds out of their... I am aware of their efforts. I understand a little bit about how they're doing it. I am not working with them only because I'm not given the permission to do so. <laughs> but are their methods similar to the ones you're talking about? No. No, they're going more on provenance, um, provenance of the source, provenance of the um, author, as well as the publishers sort of things. I see. So not, not so academically derived. No. Hey, uh, Chris Walls, Meyer Corporation. Just interested, if an adversary kind of learns your your technique, could they could they basically utilize the the rule sets that you've identified to to create something that would would pass uh, on your model, but actually would be a, a fake news? Um, so this, I, I love that you asked this question because this this actually came up during a review. Um, yes, they they probably could do that. Uh, the problem is it would not get the good spread because it would now be boring news. <laughs> so we, I guess we could say that's Byzantine behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I, I, I do have the RAND study actually um, on my, my laptop right now. <laughs> so. No, I'm not um, differentiating between active measures and propaganda. Um, and I know I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll, hap I'll be happy to, to chat with you off. But I will say that the goal, one of the other goals, the real goal for, for this to me on the computational linguistics is not just to do a, something that dis discerns fake from true news, but to give something to the intelligence, people who do intelligence work that they can evaluate any story that they get on their feed and say, it, this is probably how far it's going to deviate from what actually happened. So now they have to decide if they want to get more information just to help them out. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, uh, Dr. Sample. That was a, a, a good presentation. Um, our second presenter is uh, Dr. Matthew Flynn. He serves as Professor of War Studies at the Marine Corps University at Quantico. He specializes in the evolution of warfare and has written on the militarization in the cyber domain. He is here to present his paper titled Strategic Cyber, Responding to Russian Online Information Warfare. Please welcome Dr. Flynn. Hey everybody, you can see my mic is on. Um, so I'm Dr. Flynn, my training is in history. I'm a historian, I was trained in US foreign policy. I am a civilian teaching military history at Marine Corps University. I'm one of, uh, some of you may know it, but oftentimes I have to give some background. I'm one of uh, four profs that handle a set of students, so we have an IR person, a history person, that's me, and then we have two MILFAC who teach uh, war fighting and leadership. So uh, the program, much of what I'll say today is predicated on, and is certainly in the paper, is predicated on themes or topics we address in that curriculum, which has been very useful to me, particularly as a civilian tracking how to try to cope with the uh, cyber domain, and certainly to put it in the context of the evolution of warfare. Does it represent something different? Is it something new, and how do we approach it? As a historian, uh, it is... Um, I think the chief virtue of history is we don't panic. We don't immediately brand something as new. We don't think that something's radically changed, that the United States is in peril because of simple connectivity. So that's all useful. Uh, and then secondly, trying to track a domain that perhaps cannot be militarized and has no role for military presence at all would be one of the main themes in the paper, certainly, and certainly uh, is something that resonates at the college. Uh, struck by the previous presenter, I enjoyed that very much. Uh, what she had to say, and we would certainly tell you that there is a truth and there is an objectivity, and you have an obligation to be aware of your agenda and your bias, and then once you've done that, you can then evaluate information going forward at that point. Uh, it's been a long time since I've heard Jonathan Swift mentioned, probably one of my favorites, in, in this kind of a context, so I also like that. Um, but as far as uh, thinking of fake news as satire, I never thought of that. I just thought of it as satire, but I certainly am going to give it attention going forward. Anyways, that's where I'll end here in just a few moments. I really only have three things to sketch. But it's shocking to me how, how pliable and how quickly uh, the West, and particularly the United States, is willing to compromise the strategic high ground that it enjoys in cyberspace, and to panic and to simply say it's losing this war, however defined, however poorly defined that is, and simply on the virtue of a cognitive exchange, over a, a medium that certainly reflects an American, innovative, connective practice and speaks to our values. That is sharing and exchanging information free of government oversight, which in turn would be a good, a public good and a public service and a necessary thing in a democracy, certainly resonating from our founders, that you should not be afraid of too much information, that the more information you have, the better, and that it's up to the citizen to be able to then discern what is going to govern their actions and their decisions. And it's not easy and it's not hard work and no one ever said it was going to be. And you just have to, you're just going to have to deal with being a conscious supporter of, if you wish, of democracy. And if something else, uh, then let it be so. But uh, in, this, in this context, it's probably easiest to spot is, and, and something we teach is, you always want to have the strategic high ground. You do not want to be sitting there trying to redeem a poor strategic position through a tactical or operational measure. You would want to have the high ground, and I certainly think the West did, and it's very easy to spot when it came to cyberspace, given authoritarian regimes and their initial reaction to what cyberspace represented, and that was a means for their populations to basically talk, communicate, agitate, uh, uh, get together and, and do things and over, free of government oversight. So in my case, and what the paper specifically goes into, is looking at connectivity as a good because of this, because of what it initially did was put authoritarian regimes on the defensive, and they had to learn how to cope with it. And then secondly, watching a really American-led retreat in this domain. 
and really catering to what our adversaries want us to do, which is to be scared, to be suspicious, to distrust it, to dismantle what it was, which was a beacon of openness. And then how do we get back to that? So that's where I'll try to end it. So really just those, those three things. And so in the paper, I start with, uh, I, I, will, I, I follow basically four events centered on Russian activities. First, Estonia, 2007, then Georgia, 2008, certainly the Crimea, and certainly the turbulence in Ukraine as well, and then bringing it to the elections in 2016. Uh, but with Estonia, uh, and if you look at all four of these uh, events, and if you take a close look, and if you, don't, if you don't just pretend that the Russians are in complete control of their population and of their online communities and that they orchestrate these things, what you see in these sources, existing sources, and in the literature written on it, is a very nuanced picture, not the simplification that the Russians are perfecting some engine of war where they're able to team a popular mandate to, with their military actions. And so certainly in Estonia, I, the Russians are clearly caught flat-footed. The Russian government clearly did not expect there to be an online community beleaguering the Estonian government, and they had to respond to it, and they had to do something to it. And eventually when it flittered out, I think there was great relief in the Kremlin. You turn to Georgia, and there is, uh, just a year later, and there is an effort to, of course, control this online community and use it to their advantage. And they certainly succeed in that, but not totally. There are still lots of groups on the blogosphere that continue well before the Russian offensive on the ground in 2008 and after. Both, in both cases, uh, the Russian government, again, having to react, having to figure out how to cope with this stuff. Essentially, what you're seeing is a Russian population not famous for its democratic movement actually expressing democratic tendencies. And I can't think of anything more alarming to a Russian autocratic system than watching their population, given a new technology, actually be able to get past and for once express themselves clearly evident in both cases. When you move forward to Crimea and Ukraine, of course, this is happening in the shadow of the second turbulence in Ukraine, where an elected president was again overthrown, or it was cast into doubt, and there was violence. The internet clearly has a lot to do with that, and Russia has to respond. It should, it should not surprise us that the color revolutions, in first in Georgia, and then later in Ukraine as well, previous to this, also are gonna color that context, and they're certainly gonna make a mark on Putin. So watching these events, uh, the Russians, the, the Kremlin, I, and I, I guess I think I would eventually center it on Putin. Uh, that individual is watching this and saying, well, clearly you have a interface that is expressing and answering to Western sensibilities and values and is a tremendous threat to us. And what we really need to do is figure out a way to cope with this. So that uh, is essentially what's going to come to roost in 2016. And I think they would be pleasantly surprised how, uh, how the reaction to that and our own inability to cope with uh, what transpired there. In other words, I'm saying it was already a poisonous atmosphere in the United States. The Russians didn't create that. They simply piled onto it. And I think we need to take ownership of, of what was happening and how we approach our political discourse in this country. The Russians clearly seeing an opportunity to do this. And I think they would be just, just tremendously surprised how easy it has been, how, 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 how glad... We're not a very vibrant democracy after all. Perhaps what social, social media has held up most of all is a mirror to show us that, I don't know if it's new, but maybe some of the ugliness that always accentuated what we were is with us. And perhaps the Russians were astute, I doubt it, but were they able to track it and hope for something? Yes, and so what does this mean? Essentially, I would tell you it means that they were able to take a strategic, I mean, the goal here is to take a strategic deficit, theirs, and turn it around. So if they can get us to do something to our internet and perhaps to warp it or change it, that'd be a tremendous success for them. Uh, would I consider it an act of war? I probably would. And I would consider it a cognitive war, an intellectual domain, sparring in cyber, cyber space as a standalone element uh, of what they're trying to do. So a desired and a, and a hastily achieved and, and, and sought after event that they certainly must seem happy to see. So what I would tell you, if, you know, when you watch this, this trajectory, this progression of how the Russians are trying to learn how to cope with their strategic deficit in cyberspace, uh, our, our efforts clearly have to um, be, I think, just a little bit more clear what we want to try to accomplish. So I think uh, trying to evaluate fake news, which you just heard and you'll hear it after I finish, as well is obviously a good thing to do. I've seen other topics here where we try to ask questions about how to educate the public and teach them Perhaps how to be, I don't know what, better citizens? Uh, how, to, how to read something and not change their minds? I, I, I don't know. But, but certainly you want to think about the education. 
But by far, I would argue that there's two other things we want to do, and that's one that recognize that there is a U.S. policy in cyberspace that has been sanctioned across two administrations, that it has multiple stakeholders, and that is to defend and advance openness as an ideological platform because of its implications in terms of not just spreading democracy for the United States, but as a universal reality. And this, of course, would threaten our uh, would threaten restrictive authoritarian regimes and put them on the defensive. So just reiterating that. In other words, stop saying we need to strike back. Stop saying we're not doing anything. Stop saying we're losing the war because we're clearly in the ascendancy, or at least we were, until we, A, forget about our policy that is in place already. And then secondly, the, the uh, in my view, laughable notions of cyber sovereignty, uh, which of course is a Western construct pulled out of the 60, out of the 17th century that was specifically designed to help dictatorship, to help centralize control, to help authoritarian regimes establish themselves in Europe so that they could then have some better state practices and then further go forward and dominate power. So expressing a norm of sovereignty as a Western reality that really predicates itself on authoritarianism, not such a good idea. So I think we would want to be careful about that as well. So really, I, I would say that what we face is um, an ideological struggle that we are in position still, because I think we have the strategic high ground, to win that war if we can recognize that values do in fact drive conflict, that they're not necessarily predicated on a militarization of cyberspace, but there's something that the average citizen is going to definitely have to take responsibility for and think about and do, and that's okay. Uh, I think that uh, the platform, certainly the, the, uh, the, uh, the internet and what it represents in connectivity still represents a tremendous opportunity for us to really ask ourselves where we stand as a democracy, what we want to represent, and who we're doing it for. Is it just for the parochialism of the United States, or do we actually believe in some kind of global standard where we do try to help empower people? In other words, not pushing an American norm, but trying to reach towards a universal norm that has been something that is on in favorable light in European minds since the Enlightenment, uh, and is really something that has driven us uh, and, and a Western edifice as something that was always supposed to be bigger than just us and what we represented. It was supposed to be a world platform. It was supposed to be a world goal. And I would say technology has got us there if we could just look into it and face it and understand what we got. Uh, I can end it there. Anybody have a question? Good. Was well said. Hi, thank you for an excellent talk. <clears throat> you said near the beginning that the Russians didn't create the divisions in our society, but they took advantage and were probably surprised at how fractured our political discourse was. Yeah. Do you have any sense as a historian of what we did to ourselves to get to that point? Well, yeah, how much time do you have? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a massive topic, it's a great, I, I personally, I love that topic. Um, I, I guess to go, Short, I would say that I don't expect harmony. I do not expect cooperation. I expect friction. I'm not quite the Jeffersonian. I don't want bloodshed and violence, but I will take rancor and dissension. I would not call that a problem. I would call that healthy democracy. So that would be the first correction I would offer uh, in terms of you know, how to cope. I, I would put it this way. If we started, you really ask, not you personally, but to me where this leads is, we're asking the government to start to control the information online. I can't think of anything more to the antithesis of being in a democracy. And if you take the Russians off, I would say you're just an agent of tyranny. And that's exactly what they want. In other words, I'll take my Russian news along with everybody else's, and I think I'll be okay. Yeah, you can't yell fire in a movie house. You can't yell bomb in an airport. Um, in 140 characters, we're not talking about great intelligent, two, 280, great intelligent discourse, but stuff that really is divisive and targeted. Um, the, I thought you were going to say the opposite, that how much damage can you do in 140 characters? A lot. So what do we do? We shut it down? I mean, that's what our adversaries would like us to do. We, give proper, we can put people in education camps and tell them what the correct way to understand 280 characters are.
It's like one. I agree that I'm not a big fan of putting people in education camps, but I'd like to offer you the opportunity to say more about what you think we should do about these problems with social media. Oh, I thought I had. You let it ride. You defend openness. You let the information and the ideas flow. And you make sure it's a two-way exchange. You make sure that they're not allowed to have, that China's not able to have a great firewall, that the Russians aren't able to shut down their population and control it. Uh, it's already going on, and VPN wars would be, you know, the obvious start. So we should support the, they, I mean, Putin is, is, the, is the best example of someone in control, barely. An average individual who barely got, through fortuitous circumstances, is now in control of the state, which he barely has control on. The fissures and fractures in Russia are infinitely more pro problematic than anything we experience, certainly because we always vet these things and we always have to deal with them. I'll take my chances against a brittle, combustible, authoritarian regime before I'd worry about what happens to the United States any day. So my answer would be, you gotta keep it an open interface. You can't cave into our adversaries and come up with some cyber, new cyber policy that, further mil that, that tries to militarize a domain that can't be militarized. But I, basically the implication being we'll shut it down and change it from what it was, which our adversaries would want uh, at any rate. So I would say uh, def what our policy says, defend and advance openness. A free exchange of information without control of government I interference. So I wondered if there was a threshold, you know, you said defend uh, the, the openness of information and like the gentleman here was asserting that there's a level of, of, of something that maybe is not, you know, useful information. Do you see like a threshold where it's something that, you know, goes beyond the pall of, yeah, hey, we don't have to accept that, right? That is not yeah. something that should be uh, freely and openly exchangeable. Well, you, well sure, but, I, but that leads me to questions of crime, espionage, things like that. I, I don't want child pornography. Sure. I, I don't put pretty, want... Put a pretty high threshold. Yeah, do you think that's a high threshold? Well, I guess what I'm saying, egregious kind of content, right? So not something like the previous speaker was talking about fake news, right? So you wouldn't set the line there. You would put it, you know... I, it would be nice if... Um, it would be nice if, if the ads that are run have to be declared where they're coming from. Yeah, more of a finance um, approach. I, 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 would leave, you know, I would leave that in the hands of the private sector um, to try to do that. Um, but yeah, in terms of um, what someone writes, I mean, uh, if, you, if you read 800 words, I thought that was great, the breakdown on the word, the word lane. If you rate, read 800 words and you think you've got to the, the answer you need, I, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know how to help you with that. Uh, most of us read that stuff and say it's time to learn a lot more. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Well, behind you. So the Internet does provide a great um, capacity that if you hold some extremist views, you're more readily able to find like-minded people. Do you think that, um, you know, rather than the current system of finding you more news based on what you like, you know, finding those like-minded resources that the internet and those in industry have some responsibility of presenting the counter views? Oh, it's twice I thought your question was going to go in a different direction. Uh, and each time, should the private industry um, offer counter views? Um, well, this is the second year in a row I've sat at this conference and watched the Washington Post be pilloried as a left-wing beacon of uh, truth when, of course, it isn't, and it doesn't say that, and it doesn't stand for that. So there's a, there's a mischaracterization there. Uh, how we've... I, I would... <laughs> What can I say? The hunt for fake news starts at home, perhaps at the highest level. I couldn't say. This is what happens when you leave more time. Uh, just one quick question. Um, disinformation has been a tenet of Russian propaganda since the Protocol of the Elders of Zion. But do you believe that the medium that the Internet provides is enough of a paradigm shift where um, 
the, the, the speed and the spreading of the information is such that the, the logical assessment uh, by the reader becomes much more difficult, or is it just another step down the road of propagating whatever you want to believe in? Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, just trying to figure out how to uh, not to start ranting and address your question. Um, I, I uh, you know, the speed. I, I, I believe in information as a good, uh, and I know how this this country was framed on that. that you should never be afraid of too much information. Um, so, so I would say, bring it on, and let the heavens fall. You know, I think in the end, social media has just held up a mirror to what we are. If we don't like it, then then we got to face that. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Flynn. I appreciate it. Um, our last presenter is Dr. Pierre Luigi Salvanti. He is an honorary fellow at the Department of Political Science at the University of Naples. His research focuses on intelligence collection and election meddling through fake news and disinformation. He is here to present his paper titled Fake News, Disinformation, and Principle of Non-Intervention. -inter Please welcome Dr. Salvanti. Hi. Well, um, I just realized to be one of the few speakers today who's not an English mother tongue, so I apologize since now, and uh, please be patient for, uh, with me. <laughs> uh, let me think the um, army. Uh, let me thank the Army Cyber Institute for inviting me today to present our research at the second 18. And let me thank uh, Dr. Anakia Rotondos, my co-author, for her precious contribution at the work. What we try to do is to uh, analyze the relationship between fake news and disinformation and the principle of non-intervention trying to outline uh, scope, limits, and possible responses under international law to cyber election interference. Uh, recent, okay, recent elections and referenda, um, such as the American, the French uh, elections, the Brexit, the Italian constitutional referendum in 2016, brought to the attention of the international community several attempts by foreign states to interfere with foreign electoral processes. It's what we call cyber election interference. We are not referring here to the physical destruction of or tampering with equipment of electoral systems or the modification of the results through malware aimed at causing regular recounting which under certain circumstances uh, are to be considered cyber attacks stricto sensu, and so prohibited by international law. Nor we are referring here to cyber intelligence collection aimed at gathering information on electoral processes, which on the contrary does not seem to have per se characteristics of wrongfulness under international law. The reference here is to a destructive phenomena with a persuasi uh, persuasive scope, that is campaigns of disinformation promoted by foreign states aimed at surreptitiously influencing the vote in another state through the diffusion of fake news or alternative truths, mainly via the media and the social networks. The growing number of episodes of interference in those terms against fundamental electoral processes by foreign states makes it, makes it relevant to address whether 
they can represent a violation of international law and in particular of the principle of non-intervention. This principle is a principle of general international law, that is customary international law, which has been constantly affirmed by the United Nations General Assembly in its resolutions, with particular reference to the sovereign right of a state freely to determine its own political system, to develop its international relations without outside intervention, interference, subversion, coercion, or threat in any form whatsoever, and also with specific reference to electoral processes. The scope of this principle has been also examined by the International Court of Justice in the famous case military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua, the so-called Nicaragua case, where the court clarified, that, uh, clarified the notion of a lawful intervention, limiting it to the matters of the target state's domestic jurisdiction and in case of use of methods of coercion. The court said that coercion defines and indeed forms the very essence of prohibited intervention and is ipso facto subsistent in case of use of force. But the court did not intend to reduce the hypothesis of coercive intervention to the use of force, albeit considered paradigmatic of the phenomenon. Coercion can be also identified in the forced modification of the normal or natural or expected course of events. This approach, going beyond the paradigm provided by court, the International Court of Justice in Nicaragua, in as much as its coercion is not necessarily connected to the threat or the implementation of an unlawful act, but it's anchored to a neutral element of the achievement of a fact which, without the foreign intervention, would not have occurred. So the, the modification of the natural course of events has been underlined also in the Telling Manual 2.0, which reads that a coercive act must have the potential for compelling the target state to engage in a course of action that it would not otherwise not take. So decoupling the concept of coercion from the commission of a wrongful act, the use of force, and linking it to the constraint to act in a way in which it would not have otherwise acted. This interpretation allows to consider several activities aimed at influencing the vote and therefore foreign political choices as coercive interference and violation of international law as designed to deprive another state of its freedom of choice and force it to act in an involuntary manner. For these reasons, coercion identifies in the covert nature of the foreign intervention as the target state is not aware to be manipulated and is led to take fundamental choices without having determined them. However, this overall approach should not be overestimated. The target state must be forced, that is, it should have no other choice of possibility, which mostly translates into his awareness of being manipulated. For example, in cases of public campaigns promoted by foreign states, or in cases of endorsements of foreign leaders in favor of a candidate in foreign uh, electoral processes, the character of coercion is lacking. So these activities would not represent a violation of international law. Not, uh, in fact, uh, we can say that it's not easy to reach a unitary reconstruction of the overall regime of the foreign intervention aimed at meddling in elections through the spread of fake news. In fact, several election interferences may result in different legal qualification depending on the activities carried out and the existence and the degree of coercion. 
for these reasons, it's necessary a holistic check on a case-by-case -case basis. Moreover, another indispensable element to consider an act as an international wrongful act is attribution. Under the draft articles on responsibility of states for international wrongful acts, the so-called draft articles, an international wrongful act uh, is um, characterized by two elements. It's attributable to a state and international law, and it constitutes a breach of an international obligation. If the element under letter B may be found in the violation of the principle of non-intervention in the terms discussed, we must now dwell on the element under letter A, so attribution. Cyber election interference may be attributable for, uh, to a foreign state if mainly carried out by an organ of said state under Article 4. A person, a person or entities exercising elements of governmental authority, Article 5, organs placed at disposal of the state by another state, Article 6, or person or groups of persons directed or controlled by state. Let's consider the most relevant hypothesis. The formal attribution to a state organ would be the most direct ascription of an interference to a foreign state. Foreign state. Let's think to the um, 2017 report released by CIA, the FBI, and the NSA on the influence campaign conducted by Russia in order to meddle in the 2016 US presidential election, where a direct involvement of Russian intelligence uh, was underlined with a clear attribution of these activities to Russia. However, in practice, it is complex to reach a formal attribution to a state organ because state activities of influence, of intervention, of uh, electoral intervention in the terms discussed are carried out by foreign secret services and are difficult to trace. And we should also consider that even in case of formal attribution, the target state is hesitant to claim consequences under international law of responsibility. Moreover, we should consider that cyber election interference is mostly carried out by non-state actors allegedly acting on the restriction of or under the direction or control of a foreign state. Let's think about the um, case of the Internet Research Agency, a Russian company allegedly linked to Moscow, accused of having hired hundreds of trolls to post fake news and socially divisive contents on social media. In these cases, attribution to a foreign state is complex because of the high degree of instruction, direction, and control required by international law to attribute an act to a foreign state. In fact, both the effective control test elaborated by the International Court of Justice in Nicaragua and reflecting the draft articles, and the overall control test elaborated by the International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia in the case of Tadic in the judgment, um, in appeal judgment, uh, even lowering the standard of attribution, not an effective control, but an overall control, control. But both of them require um, a strong level or of instruction, direction, or control. So they are not effective tools um, to uh, reach. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, they are not effective tool to. Um, realize if they, the foreign state is actually controlling the groups. Because in case of um, foreign groups or uh, groups, yeah, acting um, under the instructions, controls, or direction of foreign states, uh, it's difficult to reach a, a stronger um, proof of this control. In addition, 
in most cases, attribution is not possible because of technical problems. For example, FT perpetrators can hardly be traced. Uh, yesterday, one of the speakers said that today it's easier and easier to identify uh, foreign actors. Probably it's true under a technical point of view, but under a legal point of view, so under international law, it's not so easy. In fact, identification of the origin of the IP routing or other cyber means is not a clear evidence in attributing a cyber operation. We can, okay. <laughs> uh, we can say the same in other hypotheses, but we cannot dwell on them. Uh, I just want to quickly um, underline the different options we have under international law, the choice of which depends on the overall balance of opportunities and purposes of the target state. Uh, putting apart no reaction, the state cannot react at all, this precluding any claim for reparation, but the most relevant responses uh, we can consider as uh, macro categories are contumacious and retortions. Wh wh what's the difference between them? A contumacious is an action constituting a breach of international obligation that must be considered lawful because the state involved has been itself victim of a wrongful act. On the contrary, retor a retortion is not an unlawful conduct. We can consider it a, an unfriendly act, but it's, it's not inconsistent with any international obligation of the state, even though it may be uh, a response to an internationally wrongful act. We cannot dwell on the differences between them, but we should underline that uh, countermeasures countermeasure, do not seem to be an often uh, practicable option because uh, to respond to uh, electoral interference. Because of the disconnect between general requirement of international law uh, in terms of attribution and the concrete necessity of states. In fact, as of today, there has been no reaction in formal countermeasure by target states. I'm going to conclude by saying that the complex and uncertain legal qualification of cyber activities resulting in electoral meddling, mostly due to the hard, their hard attribution, represent a serious concern for states targeted in their electoral processes. Uh, states can obtain strategic advantages through cyber counter operation aimed at containing collateral effects without entailing international responsibility. For these reasons, retortions are to be considered the most functional tool in terms of results, inasmuch as able to reach results analogous to those achievable through countermeasures but without violating international law. However, in order to reduce vulnerabilities and contrast cyber threats, sta states must build a strategy not only based on ex post legal responses, but should develop preventive efforts in terms of strengthening cyber defense capabilities to protect electoral processes. We cannot dwell on the strategies developed by the European Union in the recent years uh, because it seems I've run out of time. I just want to, okay, I've lost my last slide. However, <laughs> uh, I just want to uh, end by saying that a significant contribution to countering the spread of fake news aimed at influencing the electoral process could come from the most popular media and social networks, which should strengthen their international tools for verifying authenticity of news and profiles. The fact is that uh, cyber phenomena are an hybrid threat, and to fully contrast them, integrated strategies are required, which cannot avoid the involvement of international law as well as other disciplines. Thank you.
Hi, um, my name is Hong Lim with uh, National Defense University here in DC. Uh, question about attribution. Um, has there been a case about third party attribution, um, someone who's not a party of, um, of the, the conflict as having validity or standing in international law? For example, I could see if, if one of the Baltic countries, they go to the United States for uh, supporting attribution, uh, but then there are other countries in the region or may be suspect because we have a stake in the outcome of that attribution. So whether it's a third party country or a third par private private entity providing an attribution service that would have standing in international law. Okay, first of all, uh, suspect is not attribution. <laughs> what we, we, uh, we can say that we are talking about state responsibility for internationally wrongful act. So in these terms, an internationally wrongful act must be attributed to a foreign state, not an entity. Um, the rules of attribution are strictly provided by general international law and are reflected in the draft articles we talked about before. So, turning back to the, the main um, issue, the main uh, uh, topic of the, the, the paper. If the violation of a principle of international law is important, what is harder in this case is exactly attribution, because international law is stiff to require a formal uh, respect of the rules provided by the draft articles, which are not a treaty, which is not a treaty, I'm sorry but uh, it reflects uh, giant international law. So if we can attribute an act coming from a person or a group uh, under those rules, and uh, when I uh, say those rules, I say the ones uh, provided by part one of the draft articles, so the, the, the person, uh, uh, putting apart the, the, the case, the, the, the subject is a state organ, in this case, is clear. It's, there's a clear attribution. But the, the most difficult hypothesis is the one of persons, of groups, uh, controlled by, directed by, or um, instructed by a foreign state. In this case, what we can do is to refer to the paradigm, to the um, yeah, the paradigm provided by the International Court of Justice in Nicaragua, which is to date the most relevant paradigm of attribution, and only in cases where uh, the foreign state has an effective control. Effective control means that this control should not be general. So the person or the group, in this case, should not be an organ of that state, because in that case, we have a direct um, responsibility of the foreign state. But we cannot talk about uh, an overall control by the foreign state, for, by the foreign state. Uh, so the foreign state cannot limit itself to help financing the group or the person, but should have a direct control of the activity we think should be attributed to the foreign state. So the, 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 um, the parameters are very strict. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Toast from UK. So I think there's a there's an inherent risk here in international law that if the burden of proof is is so high as it seems to be being set here, whether that's beyond reasonable doubt at 99.9 percent .9 or whatever it is, that if I as if I have a, if I as a state receive this action against me, then I and I can't under international law meet that burden of proof, but I have sufficient proof for my own standard then I can respond knowing that that state cannot meet the burden of proof equally. 
because they can't attribute, attribute my counter response. Yeah, so yeah. you end up with almost a situation where the bar that you've imposed imposes a silent war below that threshold. Well, I think that the burden of proof is exactly the problem in attribution. But um, even though states do not have a duty to show their proofs of attribution, however, the standard of proof are very high. And it is the reason because also in previous cases, let's think the American or the French elections, uh, the target state uh, often limited to protest, not to talk about a violation of international law, because the, 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 the burden proof required for attribution uh, cannot always be reached and it's because we say we can uh, say that in most cases where we cannot talk about a certain attribution or legal term and uh, so we cannot talk about a violation of international law because without attribution there is not a wrongful act under international law uh, the most feasible um, reaction is retortion because retortion does not require um, a violation of international law, does not require a formal attribution, because it's an unfriendly act. Let's think about uh, what President Obama did after the uh, 2016 uh, uh, hacking against the Democrat uh, Committee. He expelled foreign uh, um, diplomats. But that was a retortion, not a countermeasure, because there is no duty under international law. Pardon? Okay. So, so the point being is, is, is if international law sets that bar so high, what you're encouraging is a covert war, effectively, because yeah. states know that they cannot meet that burden of proof. Um, and so they will respond unilaterally, knowing that potentially that they are going to breach unilateral war, law, but they can't meet that standard of proof be because of the nature and complexity of the environment. So potentially international law ends up acting as an encourager for activities that is actually trying to stop. No, I think that international law should improve its responses and its tools because uh, international law is uh, as an inner resilience, I think it's the correct word, um, to respond to this new phenomena. Uh, maybe um, in some, some cases international law cannot provide uh, an effective tool to respond because of the questions we have talked about. But I think that the, um, the, the tools, the responses, the responses are to be found within the existing international law, the uh, uh, existing international systems, which is able to respond to such threats. The way it will is not clear now. <laughs> Uh, that concludes this uh, track session. Uh, appreciate you uh, all uh, showing up. Thanks.